Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Michelle Branch, and I'm the board president of San Francisco Camera Work. I hope that you're all doing really well today. And if you've been rushing around, I hope that you're able to take a deep breath and be here with us in community. So I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You are joining tonight for what will be an amazing and literally illuminating conversation, which is an artist conversation between Mikhail Awuna and Jonathan Kong. Today is special because we have just formally announced the addition of four new board members to San Francisco Camera Work, all with a deep and abiding commitment to the arts and photography in particular. So those members are photographer Jean Dominique, who to be fair actually joined us a few months ago, but we have not yet made a formal announcement, uh, Mark Merman, photo editor of Mother Jones, Susan Malone, partner at the Hood and Stroud accounting firm, and last but not least, Professor Jonathan Kalm of Stanford University. So love to make that announcement that Jonathan has joined our board. So we're really thrilled. Um, we're happy with all of our new board members and really excited for what they're able to contribute. Um, and you'll be able to look at our website if you'd like to learn more about our new board members. So tonight is the first conversation and I hope it will be the first of many that Jonathan will lead for San Francisco Camera Work. Um, and again, we're really thrilled. So tonight, Jonathan's gonna be in conversation with artist Mikhail Awuna. Welcome, Mikhail. We are in the, we are in the middle of February, uh, which is Black History Month. And in many ways tonight, both artists will discuss photography through a lens of Black history, which is also American history, and we are all a part of it. Before we begin the program, I'd like to start with our land acknowledgement and then to formally introduce the artists. So I want us to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this land on which many of us call our home. In what is now called San Francisco, we are located on the stolen land of the Raymutish Ohlone peoples to whom we owe a collective debt. We have all directly benefited from being settlers on this land, and I personally am grateful. We would be really happy if you who are out there would let us know where you're joining us from, its present name, and also the name of the people who first lived there and may continue to live there. Planning tonight's program with Mikhail and Jonathan was a real treat, and soon you guys will understand why. I'd like to tell you more about the artist tonight. So first, Mikhail Aluna. Mikhail identifies as a queer, Nigerian, Swedish, American multimedia artist and engineer based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, exploring the intersections of visual media with engineering, optics, blackness, and African cosmologies. His work seeks to elucidate an emancipatory vision of possibility that pushes African people beyond all boundaries, restrictions, and frontiers. Awuna's work has been exhibited across Asia, Europe, and North America, and has been collected by institutions such as the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Equal Justice Initiative, Duke University, and National Taiwan Museum. His work has also been featured in media ranging from the New York Times to CNN, NPR, Vice, and The Guardian. He has lectured at venues that include Harvard Law School, World Press Photo in the Netherlands, the Tate Modern in the United Kingdom, and TEDx. Awuna's first published monograph called Limitless Africans was released in 2019 by Photo Evidence and was awarded as, in, the book was awarded as a finalist for the Photo Evidence Book Award with World Press Photo. Just recently also, Mikhail was added to the silver list, which is, he was one of 47 artists recognized in the inaugural silver list compiled by uh, Silver Eye Photography. And this list um, of awardees, um, they were acknowledged based on the suggestions of over 125 nonprofit photography curators, scholars, publishers, and critics. So congratulations to Mikhail. This is actually news that's hot off the presses. So thank you for being here. Um, and I have to say that before that, we got to know Mikhail and I had a chance to get to know him a little bit more personally through our 2020 benefit auction, See How Beautiful I Am. So I know many of you have seen his work and he's gonna show some of that tonight. I want you to know that the image that he presented uh, for us and to all of us in the auction was the most viewed work, the number one viewed work of all the works in the auction attracting tremendous attention. Um, so thank you, Mikhail, for being here. I know people are excited to hear from you and I've been waiting for a long time to, to really hear you talk. And now Professor Jonathan Cohn. Jonathan Calm is a visual artist in the media of photography and video, represented by Randa Branston Gallery in San Francisco. And he's also assistant professor at Stanford University where he chairs the photography department. His earlier work has focused on the relationship between technologies of representation and urban architecture and the powerful role of images in the way architectural constructs 
shape the lives of individuals and communities. His exploration of the sociocultural, historical, and geopolitical imprint of public housing on both sides of the Atlantic puts into perspective questions and implodes the white utopian legacy of European modernism to reveal hidden narratives and forgotten resonance. More recently, Calm has pointed his critical eye toward American car culture, exposing how the mythical promise of a boundless journey across the land masks a more sinister reality of African-American automobility. His new work draws inspiration from the Negro Motorist Green Book, a travel guide published during the last three decades of the Jim Crow era to direct travelers of color to safe and dignified accommodations. Through a varied array of media, including installation, reenactment, and portraiture, he creates complex representations of the Black American experience on the road as a precarious privilege rather than an inalienable right. Combs practice is international in scope and has been featured in numerous solo and group exhibitions, and his work has been reviewed in numerous publications, among which the New York Times, Art in America, The New Yorker, Art Forum, The Washington Post, and The Wall Street Journal. Calm was the 2019 recipient of the prestigious Headland Center for the Arts Larry Sultan Photography Award in partnership with McAvoy Foundation for the Arts and Pier 24 Photography. And the KQED Arts Profile, Jonathan Calm Revisits Green Book, Locations in Search of America's Past and Present, was nominated for a 2020 Northern California Area Emmy Award for Best Historic Cultural Feature Segment. So um, we are in for a real treat tonight. Uh, with both artists in conversation. It will be an educational experience and I'm sure it's going to be an odyssey as well. So um, I would love to pass the microphone to Jonathan uh, for the evening. Thank you so much. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. This is, um, you know, you, you took all the words right out of my mouth. Like you have brought it tonight for um, the introductions and um, we both really appreciate it. Um, so that means I could just jump right on in. That's Cal right. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> okay. Have fun. Good luck. So, so I could just jump right in. How are you today? Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I'm excited to be here and it's always a pleasure to talk with you, Jonathan. So yeah, it's an honor. Yeah. So I think for, for everyone, um, you know, welcome, um, to our talk tonight. Um, um, I'm really excited to be talking with um, Mikkel about his work and some of the origins around the work. Um, and I think, I think we have a good program planned for you. So what you can do as we're going through the, the process, um, you can use the Q&A chat for questions. Um, we're going to have uh, Mikkel present some work for about 20 minutes. Um, and then I'll be in dialogue with him for like 15 to 20 minutes. And, um, and then we'll open it up from, uh, for questions in the chat. Um, but of course, we'll be monitoring the chat. And if there's some good stuff in there, please, um, we will bring it forward. And, um, and I also think if there are things that we don't get to, let's say in the chat, um, right before this, I was thinking it, it might be good for us to maybe address it uh, in another form, maybe a written form um, as part of uh, uh, SF camera work site or something, uh, a sort of post conversation um, with Mikkel. So I know you didn't know about that, Mikkel, but I just thought that would be really awesome. Um, so um, first and foremost, you are in, I have a couple questions before you start. You are in um, Pittsburgh, right? Yep, yeah, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what is life like? What is art life like um, in, in Pittsburgh? And, and more specifically, this has been an unusual year for everybody, um, especially for black image makers, right? Like it's been tough for everyone. And, um, and I just like you to have a moment if you would like to, to speak about that. Like, how's this year been for, for you, for production? Um, I'm sort of have a heavy heart for our brothers and sisters in uh, creative fields right now. So I just wanna start by acknowledging that. Yeah, um, I also want to say thank you, um, first of all, Jonathan, to you for hosting this conversation, Michelle, Christina, the entire team at SF Camera Work. It's been really just an honor um, to be able to have a chance to share my work. And I think one of the things in terms of, you know, we're talking about what is it, what has the past year meant for a lot of creatives, particularly Black creatives, you know, being in Pittsburgh, 
I think it's been it's been really devastating. I think the arts have been just devastated across the board. And I mean, I think one of the pieces is that, you know, us sitting here, we do have like a, a big position of privilege. You know, a lot of the young artists who are just starting or people who are not even young, but they're just getting started with their careers. Exhibitions are closed, you know, a lot of opportunities have been closed down and people are really struggling. People are really, really hurting. And so if people have the opportunity to support local artists, support local arts organizations, please do, please because I think this is gonna be another really hard year for the arts. And so everybody needs their everybody needs your support. And um, so I think in terms of me, in terms of being in Pittsburgh, so I actually was born in Pittsburgh. I grew up in Pittsburgh. My family's Nigerian and Swedish, but I was born in Pittsburgh and went back to Nigeria. And then I came back to Pittsburgh when I was three. And I was gone for many years. And then I moved back to Pittsburgh four years ago. And I think it was, I think one of the things with COVID has been that it's forced me to stay in Pittsburgh um, to actually establish a sense of roots and reconnect with home. I think that's one thing that I was really missing for many years was that sense of groundedness and that sense of place. Um, so I've had an opportunity to really find home again for the first time in many years. And Pittsburgh's become that for me. And I think that's one of the nice, one of the oddly positive benefits of being forced to stay in a place for so long. Um, Pittsburgh also does have a lot of grant support for art, arts and artists, which has been really helpful. And I think it helps a lot of artists in the area here. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. We've had some wonderful conversations about um, what's been happening in Pittsburgh. And I'm, I'm actually inspired um, with the institutions and also um, the support. Um, but thank you for um, directing us to you know, younger artists. We are sitting here um, safe and sound and talking about our passion, which is photography and art. And, uh, and I don't want to take that for granted, right? So, so with that, um, let's dive right in uh, to your work, your presentation. Awesome. awesome. So one of the reasons I'm excited, but also a little nervous to be talking to everybody today is that I'm actually, I'm also going to be sharing, I, mean, I think many people have seen the images, but not only am I going to share the images, but I am also going to share the specific African, West African myths that are associated with each image. And so there's a mythological and cosmological language that's encoded into the each of my photographs for the Infinite Essence series. So I'm going to be sharing for the first time this research with you all. Um, so very, very excited to do so. So I'm going to screen share and um, we'll, ju we'll jump right in. So um, just a bit of background on the, on the project. So the, the press series I'm going to present tonight is from my series Infinite Essence. I was really struck in 2015 by the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and particularly how the body of this black teenager was desecrated and left in the street for hours. And afterwards, the media took pictures of the body and the body was then shared across the world without the permission of his family. And after that, I kept seeing this, again, this barrage of images. You know, um, we have George Floyd last year, Philando Castile, Antoine Rose Jr. in Pittsburgh, Tamir Rice. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And so I was trying to think about how as a photographer and an engineer by training, I studied engineering in college, how could I respond? And I wanted to also reflect on connecting black bodies of the present across space and time to our indigenous understandings of the cosmos. So my research that's, that's based for the, that's the basis for the myths in the series come from two specific cultures. And so just to kind of give people a kind of situate people in space before we jump into the work and the specific mythologies, I have been really inspired by the cosmologies of the Dogon in Mali. And so this is a map so y'all can um, situate them. And so here you can also see um, these are um, from their masking tradition of the Awa, the Society of the Masks. And the Dogon have a, just a deep understanding of the cosmos. And so I wanted to I connect my research to the Dogon and then also to the Igbo in Nigeria. And so I am Nigerian and my ethnic group is Igbo. So I've also been really inspired by our mythological systems there. And so 
with the work, I, in terms of the methodology, we'll get more into some more details later down the line, but what I do is I begin by actually hand painting all of my models' bodies with fluorescent paints. So these are actually all done pre prior to actually taking the picture. These are all done on um, with the models ahead of time. And I then, using my engineering background, I built my own flash that only transmits ultraviolet light. And so in total darkness, I click down on the shutter and the model's bodies illuminate for a fraction of a second with these patterns of the cosmos. So this is an effect known as ultraviolet induced fluorescence. And we'll see a bit more of that about that um, in a moment. And each of these images are also connected to these specific mythologies. Um, again, bringing us from the space of thinking about the black body as a site of state violence to these transcendent ethereal vessels and cosmic vessels of eternal life that connect to our understandings of blackness from our African traditions. And so the title of this piece, and so each of the pieces I'm gonna share um, the title and then the, the, the caption. Um, so sharing the actual mythologies. And so the title of this piece is Ama's Womb. And in Dogen cosmology, Ama is the primordial creator God who is this um, multi-gender polyvalent black figure, you know, everything in blackness is the source of eternal life. And the universe emerges from um, Ama's womb. Inside of Ama's womb, there are these prefigured signs which encode all of the potentiality of the universe. And so blackness is this space from which the entire universe emerges, all life emerges. And this is located in Ama's womb. These are include stellar bodies, they include the human fetus, and in the utter blackness of Ama's infinite womb, all beings await their gestation and form. So yeah, each of these images are connected to these specific mythologies. So giving you all a bit of background on how I've been thinking about um, each of these images and the context for them. So the title of this piece is Lebe and his articulations. And so this one's also connected to a specific Dogen myth of the creation of the universe. And so again, this is Black History Month. So I'm excited to also be sharing these mythological stories so we can understand historically speaking, how have African peoples envisioned the emergence of life and in the emergence of the universe? And so the story of Lebe. Lebe was a descendant of the eighth ancestor of humanity in the Dogen system. He was the oldest man at the time, and he was the first to die and be buried. Upon his internment at the strike of the smith's anvil, a serpent god descended into his tomb and swallowed his body whole. The god then expelled a massive torrent of water which regurgitated Lebe's body into colorful stones that formed the outline of his body. The joints were the focal point of Lebe's body and for the Dogen represent the most important parts of a human being. And there's a sacred number associated with each one. So this is Lebe and his articulations. The title of this piece is Nomo Die and Nomo Titean, again, connected to specific Dogen myths from, um, from Mali in Dogen country, modern day Mali. So, Within a lot of African systems too, there's this motif, recurring motif of divine twins. So you'll see this in the image too. So the divine Nomo twins in Dogen cosmology represent both the first ancestors and gods from which all people descend. So humanity, we descend from the gods within African systems. Nomo Die was the great Nomo and is the first and remains in heaven as the agent of the creator god Ama. His twin Nomo Titean is the messenger of the Nomo. He guards and protects his spiritual principles, and together they play a central role in the cosmic structure and unfolding of the universe. One of the other pieces that I've also been really fascinated by in my research is the presence of Dogen diviners and their understanding of cosmological systems and also of, of celestial bodies. And so this one's dedicated to one of those diviners, a Dogen diviner, so titled Inekozo. Inekozo Dolo was a celebrated Dogen diviner and Amayana, priestess of Ama. Closing her eyes, she was adept at fusing the blackness of her inner imaginal worlds with the external blackness of outer space. She would delve into the womb of Ama, this um, Dogen primordial creator god, and she would have these visionary experiences and uncanny perceptions of stars and celestial bodies. And in 1950, she shared with French anthropologists the weight 
size, composition, and color of Sirius B, a star which is impossible to detect with the unaided human eye. So again, in terms of connecting the blackness of your internal world to the blackness of outer space, these are the ways in which African peoples have been thinking about blackness. And so blackness is not this flat sociopolitical construct. Blackness is a divine cosmic principle of the universe from which all life and existence emerges. One of the other um, really interesting motifs that we see in a lot of different West African societies is the notion of the divine smith. So this one's de dedicated to the divine smith and from a Dogen context, Demena the smith. The smith was the first divine human ancestor to descend from the heavens to earth in Dogen cosmology. He slipped first into the workshop of the Nomo, had the, he the smiths of heaven, and he stole a portion of the sun. He then fled and mounted a cosmic granary, flying on it to earth and carrying this burning piece of divine creation with him. This mass of live embers and white hot iron is still used by human smiths today. And also in my work, and we'll, I'll show some images at the very end of this of what the work looks like in person, but I also use metal plates, which is a reference to these divine smithing traditions in West Africa. So this, the title of this piece is Gosa, the Sister of the Dance. Um, this is again an, one from the Dogen, the Dogen cosmology, and one of the first human ancestors, because there's, with each of the twins, there are also female twins too. So there's also like a really pr a primary role placed on um, the feminine within our traditions. So Gosa, the Sister of the Dance, is the twin sister of Amaseru, who is one of the first um, eight divine human ancestors who descend to earth from Ama's womb. So they descended from the blackness of space to earth and the celestial arc. She serves as Ama's first priestess on earth and her name alludes to the dances of Dogon women that represent fish swimming in water. In these dances, using successive steps, the woman recalled the formation of the fetus, which is a symbolic fish and its swimming movements in the waters of the womb. So this is Gosa, the sister of the dance. So now I'm switching to a lot of the, from the Igbo context, and then also going to show a little bit behind the scenes of how the images are made. So you can get a little peek in a, in a moment. Um, and so the title of this piece is Madu, which is the enlightened one. And in Igbo, the word Madu, which means human being, but it's a contraction of the words Ma which means beautiful, and ndu, which means life. And that together, they mean the beauty of life. So you can think of this word that means human being also representing the beauty of life. And in our cosmology, we believe that the beauty of life is in becoming a fully realized, spiritually enlightened individual, an enlightened one, who is deeply connected to and draws on the primordial blackness of the Igbo creator god, Chukwu. So this is so you can see a little sneak peek of the actual process, um, a little you know behind the veil. You know, um, I mentioned earlier that in terms of creating the work, I built my own flash that only transmits ultraviolet light. So here you have my flash, and the model's body is already painted, but the paints aren't visible in the visible spectrum, or they're very barely visible. You can maybe see a spot here and there. And using this technique of ultraviolet induced fluorescence, the paints absorb the ultraviolet light that I emit from the, the flash. And then there's a step change and they release a portion of that energy in the visible spectrum. And so I think about this space of transfiguration, you know, moving from the visible spectrum where we have, you know, this whole structure of white supremacy and anti-blackness to the spectrum of light that is not visible to the human eye and interacting with that we get these divine cosmic vessels that represent the black body in a way that connects to our ancestral connections to the primordial blackness that created the universe. So just three more and then I'll show um, just a little bit of work and then we'll um, segue back into the conversation. Um, this is another one from the Igbo system and in the Igbo system, we had also a notion of not just having us one, one soul, but we had eight spiritual bodies, you know? So not a, so um, here, this is dedicated to one of those spiritual bodies, the Akamu, 
which is the incorporeal astral double of the corporeal body. And so in addition to the physical body, human beings possess these eight spiritual bodies in the Evo system. And Akamu is the astral double of the physical form and continues to exist after death. And this is another motif in my work, you know, that in within African systems, death is not the end. We have all these cycles of life, death, and rebirth, life, death, and rebirth. And for me, that's such a powerful antidote to these uh, societal notions of the black body just being a site of death you know, an end point, you know, our systems have always been regenerative. And so, you know, the Akamu, it houses the, it continues to exist after death and it houses the personality, mannerisms, experiences and features of the individual. And it maintains them as etheric records of the deceased. So this is the Akamu, the incorporeal astral double of the corporeal body. So this is actually um, the image that was shared as part of the SF Camera Work benefit auction. Again, thank you to everybody who supported SF Camera Work. It was just an amazing auction, which I think also really, um, really centered the presence of particularly Black photographers, which is just really amazing to see. And also allowing us to think beyond maybe just traditional understandings of photographic media, um, the photographic medium. And so this is the image that was featured there and it was such a pleasure to share it. And so here, so on the, on the uh, when we did the auction, I didn't share the actual mythological context <laughs> behind the work. So here's a, a peek at actually the meaning of the piece that was in the auction. So the title of the piece is ok Oku na Mmiri, which is fire and water in Ibo. And so there's a powerful Igbo axiom that states that the human being is a synthesis of fire and water. And so fire and water are both cosmic elements that were born at the origin of the universe. And so you see that on the body being referenced here. The ancient Igbo divined that the human body incarnated the same fundamental elements found in the stars and that we host quantities of these elements in our physical forms. So that's the actual foundational myth and understanding that went into the, um, un my understanding of this piece. So this is the last one I'm gonna share and it's actually a self-portrait. <laughs> and then I'll share just a, a view of the work in first physical space, cause we're in virtual space. Um, and so, this, I did a self-portrait for myself for the series in 2018. It was for a local show in Pittsburgh um, that was featuring queer artists and our understandings of self-portraiture. And it also gave me a lot of insight into the actual, how did the process work um, for the models? How did it operate? So I actually painted my own body, well, nude, all the shoots are nudes. I, I, I stripped myself nude, painted my own body. And then I sat in the dark for hours taking these taking different images um, with my camera, my um, flash on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, a timer. And I was through that process feeling very much a connection. Like you, you, in the, in the, when you actually take the images, everything is black. And then you have this moment where the flash emits and then your body glows and then you disappear again. And in those moments of kind of glowing and disappearing again, I felt um, a really strong connection, an ancestral connection that was happening there. And so I, the title of this piece is Dibia, the Diviner Healer, and is dedicated to some of my ancestors in Nigeria and in, in the Igbo portion of Nigeria. And so the Dibia in Igbo society is both a diviner and healer. And the word is a contraction of the phrase Diabia, which means mystic expert in knowledge and wisdom. Dibias undergo constant and rigorous training to expand their understandings of the universe. And I descend from a lineage of Dibias in Abagana, Nigeria. And so with this portrait, I am working to pay homage to their work and extend their cosmic, le cosmic legacy in my own way through the medium of photography. And then to end, just to give people a sense for, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning, the use of metal being really central in the pieces as referencing the work of West African, West African metal workers and the divine smith. And so all of the pieces are actually dye sublimated onto aluminum metal plates. So these are actually recently acquired by the Duke University School of Engineering for their new building, which is my alma mater. 
And so these are 40 by 60 and 40 by 60. And so you can see actually the interaction with the, that spiritual medium of metal happening through the, uh, the parents themselves. And this is another um, in situ shot so that you go can see. So this is, this is a 40 by 40 and 40 by 60. And so this was actually from my first show in New York at the Ford Foundation Gallery in New York. So thank you all so much. I'm going to unshare and then I think Jonathan has some comments. Hello. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you for that awesome presentation and for um, going a little deeper um, with us. I've been off camera here scribbling notes because um, because that's what I do. And um, <laughs> I always take lots of notes and, and try to stay within the moment. You know, when I'm looking at this work right now with you, there's a couple things that come up that I, I think I'd like to ask a little bit about. Uh, painting is coming up more than when we, we when we've spoken before and in this moment and and um, but with the addition of the the narratives, you know, I'm thinking about the Ibu and the doggone people and I'm thinking about how I've experienced them, right, growing up in museums on white walls, on pedestals, objects, you know, removed from spirituality, right, there's their spiritual um, use and story. Um, and at the same time, I'm thinking about um, sort of an oral tradition, right, mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm, I'm to understand that these stories are passed down from one generation to the next, um, obviously in book form and music, um, but also, you know, from grandparents, mother to you. Um, were these stories that were, how did, were, were these stories that were passed down to you? That's a great question. In short, no. <laughs> I think one of the really destructive elements of colonization has been the erasure of and the destruction of many oral many of our oral traditions. Even when I share a lot of these stories, particularly the Igbo stories, with Igbo family members, many many of them have no idea. And so I actually had to do a lot of research to uncover my own culture's understandings of the origins of the universe. I've had to dig for years. And so I think that's one of the pieces that I think is really important about sharing the mythologies so that we can place ourselves in the context of the universe and also this our divine cosmic ancestors understanding of the cosmos. So that's why the mythology interaction with mythologies is super central for me, but I had to be something that I had to uncover. And so I'm hoping that as I share more and more of them through presentations like this, through wall text, through exhibitions, that it can also help to revive a lot of, a lot of those um, African indigenous understandings that we've had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, could, I can completely relate to that, even thinking about my own origin, you know, here in the United States, I, I don't know, you know, how, where that goes after, you know, my family in Brooklyn and some family in um, North Carolina and Georgia. Um, and in a way, some of our conversations make me a little bit more interested to genetically, like through testing, go back and, and sort of see, right, what, what could be there. Um, is this, when did this start for you? When, when did you realize that you needed to have some of these answers? Like what was happening that in a way that made you think that things aren't squaring up the way um, that you thought they should in terms of your own personal narrative or your family's narrative? Um, I, I think really the start for that, I mean, it came really early when I was a teenager and I was coming out and struggling with my sexuality. And I had family members telling me that this is not of our culture to be queer. And so I had to really, I mean, that really struck me and really hurt me at the time. And it wasn't until a few years later that I actually was doing the research on 
pre-colonial African sexuality and gender and understanding that this narrative of what that heterosexuality is, what African is, was came from Europeans. <laughs> and that within African systems, people we would now deem to be queer were the diviners. They were the healers. They were the spiritual leaders. They were the gatekeepers. Um, something that Maladoma Somme talks about is that queer people were the gatekeepers. We are the gatekeepers to the spirit world within African societies. And so it, that just totally was different than what I was hearing, the narrative that I was hearing. So that informed me doing my project, Limitless Africans, my first documentary series, and then has then fed into this new body of, um, this new body of work and that interest in interrogating those primordial understandings and that we have. You know, and thinking about the images that, images that you shared um, and the stories, are we to start with uh, Ama's womb? Is, is that where you started? Is that, should we start mm -hmm. with the beginning or uh, in your own work or in your own sort of entry, did you start at a different point or did you start um, at the beginning. Yeah, that, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, so. It was also the first the entire, image, yeah. you know, uh, but. Yeah. So the entire, I think it's interesting because the entire universe starts in Amma's womb, but I think my journey to understanding the mythologies did not start there. I mean, I had to kind of work my way back to these origin stories from much more distant, you know, like stories of the first humans and then kind of moving back through a lot of research. So yeah, within the context now in which I'm thinking about the work, it's interesting because that was actually one of the first images from the body series that I that I took for the for the work. So in a weird way, it's kind of circling back. But yeah, I think well, if we think about the myth, that is the origin place. But in terms of my my own path, because I didn't grow up with these stories, I didn't start there. I had to kind of work my way back um, to mm -hmm. Amma's womb. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and I'm thinking like, is there, you know, is there a rebirthing process when in the coming out process, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like you can live a life. Some some people get there early. Some people you know, in previous generations got there mm. in their 40s, 50s, 60s, when it, you know, they were allowed to, or they felt comfortable enough. Mm. Like, so I'm just thinking of the, the starting points based on when you decide to be who you are and who you need to be, right? When you follow your, your true essence and your true voice. That's a really cool way to think about it. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it that way, but I think that's definitely, I think that's definitely true. I think that's definitely true, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I have a, I, I need to ask a little bit more about Sirius B. Mm. Because one, it sounds very serious. Um, <laughs> and, and you connected that to um, blackness, to outer space. So huh. I need to understand a little bit about this. Is um, a diviner, Sirius B is a diviner? So Sirius B is a star. Oh. And so the star Sirius is the, the constellation of Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. And within so many African traditions from like ancient Egypt to the Dogon, like Sirius is, has a really, really central role in understanding of the calendars. And within the Dogon system, Sirius is the location from which the universe emerges. We also see this in the Igbo myths too. This is Sirius is the site from which the universe emerges and that humanity descends in an arc, celestial arc from Sirius to earth. So humanity actually comes from the stars. Sirius B in particular is a really, is really interesting because it's the secondary star in this, in the constellation. And you can't actually see it with the, with the unaided human eye. It just, it's, Sirius A is so much larger that you can't see Sirius B. But the Dogon have been, were able, were able to through divination to 
divine the, the presence of Sirius B and the orbital period of it. And they have a festival called the, 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 called the Siggy Festival that happens every 60 years or so that's timed around the or orbit of this star that you can't actually see with the human eye. And so I was really just struck by the fact that, you know, these people who, you know, people deemed to be, you know, like, oh, they don't have any technology or anything, detected Sirius B a thousand years before Europeans. <laughs> So yeah, so Sirius B is a is a is a star, um, and for, it figures in a really prominent role within these um, the the particularly in the Dogen society. Yeah, this is fun. This is fantastic. Um, you are you are taking me back um, to some of my relatives and back in Brooklyn, um, where we had some some books and some posters of of Africa of ancient Egypt um, on the walls. And I feel like we didn't really understand, right? What mm. all of that, um, all of those symbols, all of those all of that beautiful architecture, like what it meant. I hadn't studied, um, you know, history at that point um, in any shape or form, but I knew that it was a place where there was black excellence. That's what mm. I'm going to call it, using today's terms, right? And what we know that. Well, in the United States, that when there is black excellence, there is um, the other side of that is a sort of black death and black mm -hmm. torture um, um, within the United States. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a similar opposite um, in the Dogon and or Igbo culture where there is this, this divineness, this excellence? Um, I think maybe you touched on that a little bit, mm. but um, is there an opposite force to the awesomeness um, of those lands and cultures? Yeah. So in the, amongst the, the, the Dogen, there is, so they have the original Nomo who are the, the first deities that were created by Ama and the fourth Nomo, his name is Ogo. And Ogo is this is a force of destruction who goes on this a, 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 a war basically a war path through the universe, causing disorder and causing havoc. And in order to mitigate that, Ama has to sacrifice Ogo's twin, and then Ogo's twin. Ogo, the blood of Ogo's twin forms the planets and the stars and the universe. And then Ogo's twin is brought back to earth, is brought back to life. And that's a regenerative act that then purifies the universe. Ogo's twin then descends to earth in this celestial arc and enters into the first pond on earth. And so actually humanity is descended from this regenerated purifying force. And so we're all, we're all descendants of these, these gods. These, these immortals. But yet there was, there is the presence of Ogo who becomes the embodied by the, the embodiment of the pale fox. And so that's one, that's this force of destruction that in disorder that figures into the Dogen cosmos. All right. I hope you all are following me out there. Are you there? <laughs> are you there? Um, all right. All right. This is good. This is good. Let's talk about, let's talk about the process. Let's talk about the, the images. I see that there's, there's a question in, in the chat um, um, concerning process. So I'd like to enter process through, I don't know, the simple things like, like selection of models. Like are these um, folks with uh, friends? Are they within the community? How, you know, what does that connection look like? And then follow that up with what is this process for them like at the end of this photo shoot there are these um, massive beautiful photographs of themselves um, mm. turning into gods and diviners and um, becoming part of this these um, cosmologies that you're discussing tonight um, what does that affect on them mm. It's been really amazing working with the models for the series. And one of the comments that struck me the most was from the one of the first 
body the, so i started working on the series in 2016 it was months of testing to actually get the methodology i tried a few different methods um and so then i when i iterated to ultraviolet photography i then began with face portraits and then i took a break and then i started doing the body series which is a lot of these images that you see um, in the images that were shared tonight and so one of the first images from the body series which was on the um, one of the cover images of an NPR article that was shared about my work. The model MM told me after seeing their image that every Black person deserves to see themselves in this way. Mm. And MM broke down in tears seeing their body so connected to the cosmos and to our deities. And so I think for me, that was really a turning point in the work was seeing that impact that that can have, you know, which is such a rebuttal of the typical narratives that we see surrounding the black body within um, contemporary culture. So yeah, it, I think so that so I think a lot of the models are, when I began were friends, um, people who I'd worked with on my previous series Limitless Africans. So I used some people who I were really close confidants and then we collaborated again on the Infinite Essence series. And then as I was have been progressing through the work, I've been started working with more and more dancers. And so hmm. I, I love working with dancers. <laughs> <laughs> so, if there, so if there are black dancers out there that want to collaborate, let me know. I love working with dancers. <laughs> Are, are they easier to, 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 do they understand their bodies? What is it about that? Oh my gosh. What is it about a, a dancer? So and, for the dancers, their bodies are their art form. The yeah. movement is their art form. Right. Um, and so they're, ch they're channeling these energies um, and that's their art. And so, yeah, I feel like, I feel like that presence just really comes through. Um, and a lot of the myths and the narratives are evoked in them. One of the un interesting pieces is that within um, the in Igbo context, if people remember at the very, if you can look at the recording, the first, um, when I shared the slide on the Igbo people that showed the map of Nigeria, the masquerade there was the Ijele masquerade. And there's West African masquerades are really interesting, but in the book I was reading about Igbo cosmology, there's this idea that the entire universe is dancing and that the vibration of dance represents the dancing of the universe. So all, even the vibration of the atoms within our bodies, that's a dance. And mm -hmm. so you can also see that connects to string theory and these other um, concepts, but yet dance has this really powerful way of connecting us to the origins of the universe. And so I think that's also what comes through in the collaborations with the dancers, love them. <laughs> and 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 how do they there's a, a few questions in the chat um about the actual painting of mm -hmm. of the models of the dancers um or just the models um in terms of are you how i don't know i don't know if we need to know like the application but like yeah but you're doing it like and you can't see it do you have like some UV lights on. Um, I'd love that um, you're an engineer and you're in the, the long line of, of photographers and engineers and photographers and scientists, right? Who take the available uh, equipment or create new equipment so that mm -hmm. you, you can take the photograph that you need. Um, can you maybe talk about the, the painting process and um, and a little bit about the process that got you to needing to reconfigure the light. Like on, on one hand, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, did, did, did you spend too much time, you know, out, out at the club and, you know, the music <laughs> and the lights, you know, and then, you know, that would be me, you know, and then I get home and I'm like having these dreams and I'm like, oh, hey, that's art. That's a space for art. Yeah. Can you share that with us, what that was for you? Hilarious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the way in which I iterated to the method of ultraviolet photography and building my flash was I had tried 
light painting, which I think many people know, but if people aren't photographers, it's like where you put a camera on a long exposure and you run around with these lights and you form these patterns. And that created these energetic auras around the bodies, but it didn't, you weren't seeing that emitting from the black body. And then I tried projectors too. So this is kind of over a several month process. So I tried projectors and with projectors, with projection, the body was, I had these nebulas and these ocean patterns and those were illuminated the body, but they also illuminated the background. And so you, you didn't have this separation that brought forth that divine cosmic narrative of the black body as you know central. And so when I was trying to think about how to you know tell this story, two things were happening in parallel. I was doing research on Igbo cosmology at the time and I was reading about Chinua Achebe, um, the Igbo novelist, his understanding of the Igbo concept of the soul, of the quote unquote soul, you could think of as the chi. And he wrote that in one of his essays that is the chi one ray of the infinite essence of the sun. And so again, that's where the title of the work comes from, infinite essence, is this idea of the soul. And so I was like the chi and our connection to the cosmos through our spirits, so our spirit, one of our spirit bodies, our spirit bodies. And so that was happening and I was researching that and I was like, okay, connection to the cosmos. I was really feeling that from that Chinwacha big quote. And I was trying to think about where have I seen that form of illumination and magic come forth. And I mean, this is the, um, nerdy portion but i in high school i was a huge fan of final fantasy the video game series so the japanese video game series and they had all of these like sorcerers and all these things like playing they're doing magic and so i actually went back this is december 2017 i went back to a clip that i loved as a child and i was watching it again and again it was like these sparkles forming 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 and i more i mean to be real I, I, I heard a voice and the voice was like, put the sparkles on the body. And I was like, I was like, oh, okay, okay, oh, okay. So then I started thinking about, okay, glow in the dark paints. And then I was looking at that. And then I was looking at um, fluorescent paints and then learning about fluorescent paints and how I could illuminate the bodies using um, um, ultraviolet technology and ultraviolet light. And I started testing with it and I tried like tribal paints and it wasn't really working. So I had to, it was all this testing that took up like me six months. And in terms of actual, the painting actually with the models, we sit together and we, they pick out which of the fluorescent paints are speaking to them in the moment. So there's a whole bunch of colors. Like I'll throw like 50 paints on the ground. I'm like, okay, pick out, you know, whichever ones are speaking to you. And then I, when I'm painting the bodies, I do have a black light flashlight, which I use to preview the locations just to kind of see like, okay. And I, and, I, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, as I'm applying it, we're engaging in conversation and just like really building a lot of um, trust. So yeah, that's a bit of the background of how I came to the painting and the, uh, the application. Oh, no, that's that's super helpful. There's, there's someone um, in the chat, Mark is asking, um, your work sounds like you tie into the idea that there is a divine presence in all of us. Um, he references um, Joseph Campbell. Um, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about, I don't know, the divine in all of us, or, you know, you can choose to, to think about that in any way that you would like. But I, I would like to add a little extra piece to that, which is thinking of the body um, as a marker of um mm. of deep time as well um mm. in terms of your treatment um hmm. Hmm. well i think yeah. the first portion is a bit easier for me to respond to yeah. the second portion i think maybe let's, I have let's a, talk a bit more about I that i have a follow-up to the second part. <laughs> okay yeah, yeah. so fine. the first part in terms of the divine within all of us yeah. i mean that that's is what the within the african systems is that we are all like we are descended from deities we're descended from from gods and so i think that's one of the most important kind of realignments that mm -hmm. occurred for me was that understanding mm -hmm. so yeah do, do 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 these gods also believe in um in punishment right 
and, and, mm. I, and I, I think I, I, I feel like I, I know the answer, but maybe I, maybe I don't. I, I'm gonna, I'd like to assume that I don't because I think a lot of sort of Western religions, like there's the good, right? That we all come from this, this good, but then there's the, the, the devil, the, the evil, and, and that there must be suffering. Is mm. there, in some of these cultures, is there a, a place for, for suffering or is this just a, a Western affliction hmm. um, that we believe in? So, you know, I don't wanna to speak too broadly because I think I'm still in the process of learning a lot and still a process of doing a lot of research around these systems. So I, I don't want to speak to like specifically to that question, just because I don't want to, you know, yeah. say something incorrect. But um, there, there were for in the, in the, you know, we had talked about the Ogo, who is this kind of destructive force mm -hmm. um, in the um, Dogen cosmos that does exist before. Mm -hmm. And my and my second part to the question, let, let's just scrap that, and I'll I'll ask a, a whole new question, which um, perhaps brings it to today, or at least a lot of papers um, I've been reading um, dealing with the um, writers and theorists sort of reconnecting um, to the earth, reconnecting um, to the spirit, and 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 one word that comes to mind in thinking about this deep time is the, the term Anthropocene, right? There are several mm -hmm. movies out about it, um, mm -hmm. about thinking about um, time in terms of deep the, um, geological time. Mm -hmm. um, and as a way of also looking at sort of our, um, our human damage in a way to the planet itself. Um, so I get to this, in terms of like thinking about um, how you're treating the surfaces of the body and that they, they look as if they have uh, universes, right? Galaxies. Mm. Um, I think we also have information today with the, the right magnification that these patterns out in um, blackness, out in outer space are also present in within our bodies, right? These structures, mm -hmm. they're present on surfaces, right? If, if you go deep enough into the, the structure and the beautiful structures actually of, mm -hmm. um, of materials and within organisms. Um, is there anything there um, mm. for you? So one of the interesting conversations I actually had a few years ago was when um, um, a friend from college was looking at the work and he was com he commented he's like he's like oh um the fractal patterns and I was like and for a time I didn't really understand what he meant I was like oh, what do you mean and he was saying you know it's so interesting that the um patterns that you're painting with you know replicate the almost like the fractal patterns from which which the stars are spread across the sky and these are the type of layered systems that are encoded into our bodies you know and so there is that reference there i think in the earlier part of your question you were talking about the anthropocene and these like different kind of this this current age i think that there's a fundamental realignment that occurs when your society is structured around <laughs> these understandings of our indivisibility from the cosmos, our indivisibility from the earth, you know? And so I think one of the other pieces that's also really fascinating is that the uh, the first humans actually, this is very different, <laughs> but the first humans, um, actually like they, they, they didn't die. They actually just faded back into um, the cosmos and returned to the um, the creator into the blackness of space. And so I think even the understanding of kind of, oh, this is just this age of humanity right now. I think that's again, something that in terms of space and time that gets really challenged a lot in these systems. And so, yeah, that's just a aside. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I enjoy our asides. I think um, I think they're important. I think 
I think it's okay to, I mean, I'm, I'm so thankful that you're allowing us to have a conversation about space that you're still exploring, right? I think mm -hmm. it's okay not to have every answer tightly buttoned, right? Um, there is play, there is space, there is growth, there is more research, right? Always yeah. um, to be done. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing, right? Um, I see that uh, Jody Mack, hello, Jody, uh, says um, for the last comment, yes, I see these images as a sort of, quote, body as encoded vessel, mm. era of the universe. Um, mm -hmm. That's very nice. Um, there's another question. Um, let's see. Hi, Juran, who's who asked the question. I don't know exactly ab about what part, but he says today, um, I, I can expand up upon this. Today, what's your why? Has it changed from when you began? Hmm. So, I mean, that can go either way, right? Like, how, how would you like to hmm. approach that? Yeah, I think one, so I think, I, I was thinking maybe the why around like why I make the why I make the work that I do, et cetera. Maybe that kind of the question. I always, I always think so. Yeah. Or like, you know, why, yeah, maybe the why of what you're getting out of this project, or you know, it's it's probably a question I would ask myself in encountering any work of art, right? Mm -hmm. I walk in, there's that initial like flood of like excitement, or like I really like this, or I have questions. And then at some point, you know, I'm always asking for the, well, maybe the why, like, why is the artist asking me, you know, um, I don't know, is this just me? Do you do this with art? No, I do too. Yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> I get really, I, yeah, I get really curious about the motivation and also that space of research that informs um, the different right. projects. Yeah, I, I think as the projects progressed, the the research has been, has really kind of transformed that why. I think at the beginning it was more, you know, I was responding to these images in the media of Black death and trying to, like my why was, how could I transfigure the, the transfigure the, the Black body into these cosmic vessels? At the time, I literally would say, I was like, oh, I'm trying to reimagine the Black body as a space of magic. You know, that was kind of the thing I kept saying again and again and again. And as the, and so I think what it, what was produced was, you know, a lot of really, I think, you know, beautiful images that I think created a lot of conversation. And then I wanted to dig deeper. I really did. Because I think, you know, I think beyond just in, in, interacting with, it's not just, when we interact with images, it is also in many ways, it, what can be, I mean, a very like spiritual act, you know, interacting with images. I mean, I think that's why everybody's here. You know, we, we, love, we love images, we love photography. And how can that, transform people and so when I when I was thinking about how that piece of transformation the what was really transforming my life and my understandings of the world was this interaction with our African understandings of the universe you know it wasn't just that you know I'm just here right now it's that you know I've existed we've existed across space and time Blackness is this, this generative force that heals, that creates life. And so that's become my why, has been to share that aspect that has been so transformative for me. So hopefully that can be shared with more audiences and more people too, so that people can become more curious about, you know, African mythologies and African cosmologies. You know, I think they're so important. And I think that, you know, those are systems that have sustained societies for, hundreds of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. We're trying to find a way path forward. Mm -hmm. Let's look, let's look there. Okay. There's um, one more question on this topic. And then um, it looks like um, there's a, a question from James Leventhal, who um, Hi, James. We'll, we'll switch it up a little bit. Um, 
to talk about your other series. But before we, we make that transition, um, uh, Jasmine asked the questions, asked the question, are your subjects the universe anthropomorphize or is the universe a reflection of these people? Mm. You know, both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. yeah. The body is an incarnation of the of the universe. You know, we're not separate from the universe. The universe is within us. Like the all of the particles that form our bodies are from the stars and from the cosmos. Right. And that was the piece that was in the as a camera auction um, was titled fire and water. You know, those right. are the elements that form, you know, the, our, our, the elements of our bodies. And so, yeah, I think it's both, you know? Yeah. Um, I'd like that you mentioned actually the fire and water piece. Um, Cause I think I want to touch on that in terms of like painting. Is it, oh, yeah. is it wrong for me to want to, to lose myself out of the material of, of, of photography and out of the material of, of the photo material and like move, well, you're using paint for one, right? And, mm -hmm. and it's describing and outlining um, the figures. And I'm thinking of many amazing um, black artists, figure painters. We are in a renaissance of, of amazingness um, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to, to, to vote for your favorite or anything, um, <laughs> but is there, is there a conversation that you're interested in, in, in having with, with our, uh, amazing, um, men and women of, of painting? I know, for yeah. time, I know, but I have to, that's just me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, there's. Oh my gosh, so many amazing painters. I mean, I think one of the, I mean, I'm just such a fan that I'll just like say, I mean, Lena Iris Victor, just mm -hmm. an incredible, um, incredible painter. And in her work, she also references Dogen symbology as well. So she also thinks really deeply about these cosmic narratives of blackness and also of gold as this, cosmic element as well. So love her, love her. I love work that is kind of thinking about the cosmos. There's also another painter who I came across recently who was featured in the um, in the Dean collection. I forget his name, but he has these really amazing paint paintings that reference the, the, the Blackamoor okay. um, motif. I forget his name though. But, and then he has like alchemists and stuff. So amazing. So yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a conversation with, 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 paint, with um, painting. And yeah, even as um, I was working on the series, you know, I've been looking at, you know, Renaissance paintings, mm -hmm. um, early modern Baroque era paintings mm -hmm. and painters. So yeah, getting some inspiration from, from there as well, yeah. Were you That's looking really at the figures in those or were you looking at the, the heavenly skies, right? In those, yeah. I mean. Yeah, I think, I think it was both. Cause I mean, I think there, I mean, you can see how um, Western mythologies have been encoded within the painting, the paintings, you know, using Christian motifs, etc. So you could definitely see in which the ways in which that was really encoded. I think I was also really interested in the understanding of figurative form and even the ways in which um, there was kind of a deep attention to anatomy that was really given, mm -hmm. um, particularly in, in that era. You know, people. Man, controversial, you know, like, you know, anyway, deep, you know, interrogation of like cada people are looking at cadavers and trying to understand the human form. So yeah, I, that, that was definitely um, something. I think that anatomy piece, that was really fascinating. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, James is thinking about um, another series. Um, you have this, uh, um, this other amazing series about real people on the planet, um, specifically the uh, diasporic queer Africans, are these related, um, or how do you compartmentalize 
uh, when you have so many large projects um, and your career continues to expand uh, and he's asking us all to stay healthy and safe. Uh, Aw, hey James. <laughs> oh, James is great. Um, yeah. So my first major series was the this a documentary series on LGBTQ African immigrants, where I traveled to 10 countries across North America, Europe, and the Caribbean, and I photographed and interviewed 50 LGBT um, African immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. And so there, I used frame portraiture as a space for where LGBTQ Africans would choose their clothing and objects, and we would shoot around their homes and create these scenes where they were, I guess, quote at the time, I would describe it as being full and complete individuals. You know, they, 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 their queerness was not divided away from their Africanness. And it was, I was responding to that struggle that I had around this myth of it being un-African. So that was actually where I learned about the art of frame portraiture as a space where we can imagine and create these new worlds and new realities. And so that's was kind of, I think that's really the connective thread, that line of, of frame portraiture. One of the other pieces was definitely the working with so many queer Africans. And that um, article I referenced earlier by Maladoma Somme, he was talking about that queer people would now describe as queer Africans were the diviners and the healers and the gatekeepers to the spirit world. So I think that is also a space that kind of opened up an area of exploration into many of these more moving from the kind of the physical form to the spiritual was through that series. So I think that's one of the other connective points. Okay. How does, um, how can our audience continue um, this journey? So you, you've given a lot for us to um, process, to think about. Um, I'm specifically liking the stories um, and thinking about um, how we can expand our libraries, how we can, you know, have stories for our children that are different. I mean, I feel like these, you know, could be fascinating as, as and maybe frightening for some children, but um, mm -hmm. how can we expand our libraries? Yeah, so where, where can we start? So I think for adults there on the, from, for the Dogen, where I started my research, there's a book Conversations with Oga Tamelli, which um, I feel was like a really great starting point with, so Conversations with Oga Tamelli. And if you just look up Conversations with and you look up Dogen, O-G-O-N, you can find it. And there, so that's kind of like a nice introductory text. And then when you want to go deeper, there's the, the Pale Fox. Um, so the Pale Fox has um, a lot more information around um, Dogen religion and creation stories. On the Igbo side, there's a book, um, Leopards of the Magical Dawn, which is really, really great which is by um, Inze um, Chukuka Dibia y Nuafo. Um, so that's a really good one. And then on the children's side, one book that I actually just found recently that somebody sent to me, a friend, is there's a Yoruba mythology coloring book. Hmm. So I think that's one that for children, I think that's a really a good, good, good way to kind of hmm. learn about the, the um, so, like mm -hmm. the Yoruba system is very different. I haven't done much research there, but yeah, like that's another way that people can kind of engage. I think that's a really great one. Do they have to color within the lines? I think people can do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to not color within the lines. <laughs> okay, so we're in our, in our last 10 minutes um, and I have a couple of questions left. I think there's a little pause in the, in the chat at the moment. And um, I want to think for a moment of, you spoke at the beginning when we were talking about um, the COVID crisis and the pressures that that puts on artists, um, photographers here, and, um, and especially um, for us photographers of color. What, any suggestions, any thoughts on like, you know, here you are, you know, at, in with us at, um, SF camera work, and we are really doing the work to be engaged with our community and expanding what that looks like. Um, we have 
um, folks that are really dedicated to us as an organization and and they they let us know right they let us know what they what they would like to see um they let us know what they need um and we're looking right to expand what we do within the bay especially once you know we're able to to be together um is there something that we should know about mm. um the life of a young photographer like when you're starting out what that looks like mm. like where maybe we can be more helpful um you don't have to have an answer to it but you know being a new board member it's it's always a question that we're asking one another and um i really respect your your work and your research and and i know you have some thoughts yeah mm. that's a good question you know and i think it's a multifaceted question but i think one of the so for example in the fall there was a really fantastic conversation um with um, David Johnson and oh, yeah. oh, Lewis Watts and 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 um, Jean, and it was an amazing conversation. I mean, I I think particularly as a black photographer, it was. I mean, it really brought me into the conversation. I mean, I was really excited about that conversation, and I mean, I'm not sure, but I'm not sure if that was David's first time ever presenting at SF Camera Work, or if he's ever exhibited at SF Camera Work. But I think those are some of the ways in which. Um, Black artists, even if they're in a local community, will not necessarily get seen by institutions and can fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that there's a space of kind of, you know, intentionality around, you know, engaging with finding out who the local art, who the, the local photographers are who are doing really fascinating work and making sure to really kind of bring them into the conversation and bring them into like kind of these with um, with institutional resources, exhibitions. And so, yeah, I think that's one of the ways in which, mm -hmm. you know, institutions can really be really transformative for local artists. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that was placed in the chat, that conversation. So that, that's great. How about mentorship? What is, can we talk about the value of mentorship um, mm. for, for young photographers, for young Black photographers? Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a teacher, so I, I see it up close and personal. Um, what does that mean? How, how does that manifest for you? What does that mean for you? Yeah, I mean, we were talking about that just a few days ago. <laughs> um, I would say, hmm, I would say, I would say it's real. I'll, I'll say it's tough. You know, I think it's definitely really tough. I think, particularly for photographers who maybe who didn't go to, you know, art school, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, in art school, there's these institutions that kind of set up. You know, you can maybe meet photographers who can, you know, be mentors, etc. I think for Black photographers, Black photographers historically have had to figure out ways for ourselves. I mean, I think one of the really um, cardinal examples is of the Kamungi workshop in New mm -hmm. York City in the in the um, in the seventies. Who this collective of Black photographers who did photo crits, you know, and they were they were, they were a support network, but also, I mean, it wasn't just like, oh, we're just hanging out and partying they were making sure that everybody was pushing their craft forward, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was this network that was created and the Kamagi Workshop has a show up now at the, um, at the Whitney actually. And so I think we've had to kind of be more creative about finding mentors and finding those spaces of support. And so I think, yeah, I think it's something that I'm still coming from an engineering background, it wasn't like, oh, who are the photographers that I know? So it's definitely something that I, I, I think a lot about. And um, as younger, as I engage with younger, younger photographers, I mean, somebody told me the other day, they're like, they're like, oh, you're, you're not so young anymore. I was like, oh gosh, okay. Okay, got it, graduated like 10 years ago. Um, so, but as I work with like younger photographers, um, I try to be really intentional about that. You know, knowing how so many times I didn't feel like I had any support or really minimal support to try to guide as best as I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have, and I hope we can get that in, I know we can get that in the chat, um, portfolio reviews that we do. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think those are so valuable um, to sit down one on one with another photographer and artist and and look at your work and get suggestions and, and feedback. Um, 
if you're in a school program or not, I think, you know, feedback is critical. Um, and that portfolio is critical for almost anything I think that you need to do. Um, that collection of images that state who and what you are, right? And, and how you see. Um, so thank you for, for allowing me to, to talk a bit about um, that program, but also about mentorship and, and what that meant um, for you. Um, I think this might be my final question. Um, yeah, I think this could be my final question that went by really fast. And, um, and I do wanna ask, I think we have another little something we can do. I feel like we could do a little writing project for like a post, post thinking about this talk okay. and maybe expand some more um, through text versus a, a live conversation, if you're willing. Um, okay. What's up for you next? What do you have? Um, what do you have in the archives? What do you have uh, exhibition wise, work wise? Um, if you'd like to give us a sneak preview about what's coming up. Mm, yeah, so I actually have, um, I shot my first film, actually. Oh, and that we finished shooting in um, last month. And so we're in post production now. So that will hopefully be coming out next few months. So I think that's the big um, piece for me is kind of working on the film. And I also have a, an expansion of the Infinite Essence series in terms of photographic works that are also coming out at some point, hopefully later this year. <laughs> is this a documentary film? Is this is, is this your life story coming out? In oh my gosh, film? no, who's, no, who's no, no you? life story. <laughs> Who's playing me? No. What black it's, actor is playing you? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a, an experimental dance film oh. that recreates an Igbo myth of the creation of the universe through dance. So it's about 30 minutes in length. And yeah, I think it's a it's gonna be interesting. I mean, I think it's in conversation with the infinite essence universe in terms of visual styling in motion. So mm -hmm. hopefully people will like it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> It makes me think of the the sister of the dance. You maybe you're ah, yes, yes, bringing so. her to life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, trying to bring the African deities to life through the work. Okay. Um, did we miss anything? I'm looking. Hmm. I'm just looking through our chat here. Um, oh, thank you. Um, well. I just, I guess we can close like a couple minutes early. Um, I want to first thank um, everyone at home who, um, you know, walk the dog, is cooking the, the meals, are tutoring the children, are working from home on Zoom. Thank you for enduring that fatigue. It's real. Um, for those, you know, with the mocktails and the cocktails back on the East Coast, good night. Get a good night's sleep. Um, and tomorrow is Friday. Um, I want to thank um, SF Camera Work for um, bringing me in for um, this specific conversation. And I, I do hope that we can have more and um, feature more amazing, talented artists, photographers um, here and, and everywhere. Um, and I think the work that I do or that I've been starting with my colleagues, um, I'm really excited about. And, um, and I'm glad that we were able to start our conversation through this medium, Mikkel. And, um, and I just thank you for um, giving us a deeper look into your practice. And, um, and I just wanna celebrate you and thank you for um, being here and, and for donating um, to SF Camera Work. Um, in the auction, but also lending us your 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 wisdom and your voice here tonight. Thank you. Oh, thank you, and thanks, and th thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate you all um, staying here and spending time with us tonight. It really means the world. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great night, and um, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>